Hello and good afternoon, good morning, uh, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today, we're pleased to bring you um, this month's E4C webinar, focusing on digital development in Kenya, challenges and opportunities. My name is Mariela Machado, and I'm Program Manager at Engineering for Change. This webinar you're participating in today will be archived on our E4C's website um, and our, on our YouTube channel. Both of those URLs um, are listed on this slide. Information on upcoming webinars um, is also available on the E4C site, so be sure to check it out. E4C members will receive invitations to upcoming webinars directly, so if you haven't signed up uh, to E4C, do so uh, on our website. If you have any questions, comments, or recommendations on future topics and speakers, please contact the E4C team at webinars at engineeringforchange.org as seen on the slide. If you're following us on Twitter today, please join the conversation with our hashtag E4C webinar series. Before we move on to our presenters today, I would like to tell you a bit about Engineering for Change, or E4C. E4C is a knowledge organization, digital platform, and global community of over 1 million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists um, wanting to advance technology to solve quality of life uh, and challenges of underserved communities. Some of those challenges include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy, uh, improved agriculture, and as you will see on this uh, webinar today, lack of access to digital technologies and internet connectivity. We will invite you to become a member once more if you're not already signed up. InfoC membership is free and provide access to news and insights um, and hundreds of solutions in our solutions library and um, resources on job opportunities, fellowships, funding calls. Um, E4C members uh, also receive exclusive invitations to online and regional events and access to resources that are aligned to their interests. So be sure to sign up. So before we get started, let's do a couple of housekeeping items um, to practice a little on the Zoom platform. If you haven't already, uh, please type in your name in the chat window of what part of the world are you joining us from? Um, if you cannot find that window, it's at the bottom of the screen in the middle of the slides. Just click on it and let us know where are you joining us from? Brooklyn, Sweden, welcome Sweden, Ethiopia, Munich, Montreal, Canada, Colorado, Ghana, Jerusalem, welcome, Uganda. So we have, as you can see here in Nairobi, of course, um, we see from all over the world, welcome. We're super thrilled to have you, Malawi, Pakistan. So as you see here, we reach all corners of the world. Welcome, welcome. Um, on the, another um, housekeeping item and instructions before we get started, you can use the chat window if you wanna share remarks during the, the webinar. But if, and, if, and if you have an, any technical difficulties, you can send us a private message at Engineering for Change Admin. If you're listening to the audio broadcast and you encounter any trouble, try hitting stop and then start. Um, during the salon, please use the Q&A uh, window located uh, in the chat. We will be opening a Q&A at the end of this presentation, so be sure to type your questions beforehand in the Q&A chat, also in the middle of, uh, at the bottom of the screen in the middle of the slide. So be sure to um, type in your questions before, um, before then. Um, let's move on right to our topic for this webinar. But before I pass it to our moderator uh, today, um, I wanted to provide a bit background about the research that we are presenting to you today. E4C's uh, research work cut across geographies and sectors to deliver an ecosystem view of technology for good and infuse engineering insights into global development. Targeted research is conducted in collaboration with partners and sponsors like the one you will be hearing today with iGov, Huawei, Kenya, and Engineering for Change. And we do this to infuse engineering rigor into world changing development efforts. In this case, we're focusing on Kenya. This type of research provides, as you see at the right, systems knowledge, cross-cutting networks perspectives, and we also prepared the future workforce through our fellowship program. 
our, as you can see here, we also have uh, that criti critical research questions. And you see here the diverse partnerships that we cover, and that is from nonprofits to universities to private sector. Um, and we infuse that knowledge to provide unique insights and essential human infrastructure. The research is, is conducted, as I mentioned before, that talent is being prepared through our fellowship program. The research, um, it's done on behalf of our partners and sponsors and is delivered as reports with implementable insights. If you would wish to learn more about this unique workforce development program called the E4C Fellowship Program, uh, go to our website on the link on the slide and we'll be sharing also uh, in the chat. Applications are open until February 28th. So if you wanna become an E4C Fellow for 2021, be sure to check it out and apply before February 28th. As you see here on this slide, our fellows cover the whole continent. We have awarded 86 fellowships so far, and you'll be hearing from one of them, Jacob from Kenya. Um, and we have cross-cutting um, uh, engineering expertise, as you see on this slide. And we have uh, covered also 24 nationalities, 56% women. Um, if you have any questions or ideas to work with us on our research project, be sure to reach out to us and to check out also our annual reports published on our website. Um, contact us at research at engineeringforchange.org if you have any questions, ideas, or you wish to partner. So let's move right into our uh, research for today, the ICT landscape analysis of Northern Kenya, challenges and opportunities. This research uh, was conducted on behalf of IGOV Kenya, as I mentioned, uh, IGOV Africa and, and uh, Huawei Kenya. And something that I just wanna highlight before I pass it on to our, our presenters and, and our speakers, fellows conducted uh, 14 semi-structure interviews with stakeholders in the ICT sector especially those with expertise in agriculture, education, health, and income generation. They also did um, desk research, what we call desk research, uh, gathering data around what is, what is happening in Northern Kenya in terms of digital technologies. So be, before further to say, and you'll be hearing some details from the fellow itself in a few minutes, I will pass it on to Ronald Osumba. Uh, uh, Ronald has uh, 18 years of work experience in the field, in the private sector, public service and entrepreneurship, having held leadership positions in technology and government cooperation. He's now the founder and chief executive officer at I Got Africa Limited at Boutique Innovation House and also co-founder um, of M Safari, a passenger manifest digital payments and data analytics platforms that provides the Kenyan government and public transport stakeholders with commuter data insights and helps in contract tracing for COVID-19. Um, without further to say, Ron, I would be reading your bio for a long time. We're, we're thrilled to have you. We're honored that you will be moderating this panel today and that you're a partner of Engineering for, for Change. So without further to say, I will pass the mic to you, Ron. Thank you and welcome. Thank you, Mariela, for um, um, that introduction and welcome everybody from wherever you are across the globe. Um, we are happy to see people from, you know, so we have morning, afternoon and evening all represented in this uh, webinar and we, we really appreciate your presence here uh, today. As Mariela has said, uh, you know, I've spent a bit of my um, career in the tech space, mostly working with public service and uh, leveraging technology for good. So very excited to be to have been part of this project. And um, I just now want to invite all the speakers to briefly introduce themselves. And then we will come back to the real flesh of the conversation. And we will start off with Jacob. Thank you, Ronnie. Uh, my name is Jacob and I'm based here in Nairobi, where I work as an ICT consultant with Aslan Africa Limited. And I'm also uh, a columnist with iAfrican Media and Tech Moran, where I write about uh, various things to do with business, technology, and how digital technologies is impacting lives in East Africa. Uh, I was also a need for in 2020, and I'm glad to be part of this meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, Abdi Hello, everyone. 
My name is Abdenur Ali Mahdi. Uh, I'm a telecom engineer, uh, former telecom engineer, let me say, and education technologist, and the founder of MLUGA app. And uh, today I'll be here discussing about the challenges that has been uh, that is faced by the innovators from the northern part of Kenya and the ICT challenges. First, and information because um, from this from the time I started the startup up to today, where it's reached, it has been a very long journey, and I will be hoping to share some of the experience. Uh, with that. So basically, M. Luga was uh, awarded one of the best 100 startups in Istanbul worldwide out of 160,000 applications. Those are just few of the of the, of the awards that uh, we got uh, uh, after a very long struggle. So we're going to share about the challenges about uh, the startup and how we overcame it. Thank you so much. Thank you. My name is Caroline Kiari Kimondo. I'm the head of exploration at the UNDP Accelerator Lab. Uh, my role is to collect, um, identify new data, new partners, new information and insights that will, that will inform development work in the international and, no, and national space. Um, previously, I worked in the philanthropy space where we provided grants to women's rights organizations, and then I um, branched out into social innovation work, and that is what is, has led me here, and I'm very passionate about this work, and I'm very happy to be here, so thank you. Carol, and also just to note that uh, Jacob was one of the fellows who conducted uh, this research, and so he will be giving us um, real insights into the conversations that he had uh, with people from across uh, Northern Kenya. Just a little bit about uh, IGAP Africa. We are a boutique innovation house, essentially uh, bringing together the ecosystem, the innovation ecosystem. So whether you're talking about problem solvers, enablers, conveners, and promoters to address real social issues, leveraging technology. We try to close the gap uh, for citizens to access services uh, not just from government, but also from development partners. We are working to support uh, knowledge sharing, you know, co-creation, and we do this in three ways. We've developed a community of innovation for innovators who are focused on civic tech and gov tech. We are building, we're in the process of building an open data and open APIs platform that will make it much easier to share data on public services. And finally, we are this year going to publish a digital government index essentially to track the use of digital technology in improving uh, delivery. So when you look at our business, we really have uh, the ecosystem. And uh, next, and the ecosystem essentially we are looking at is around, um, you know, four areas. Sorry, Mariela, next slide. Um, as an integrator, we are looking at who are the problem solvers? Who are the people who are building digital technologies and other uh, 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 technologies, you know, whether big tech or old tech to address this problem? So whether they're SMEs, startups, uh, social entrepreneurship, which is now becoming a big thing uh, in this part of the world and individual developers. We then connect them with um, 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 enablement platforms. So that is whether we are, you know, we are connecting them to hubs, um, we are connecting them to engineering labs where they can test their ideas. We are providing them with platforms um, on open data. Um, we are linking them with connectivity as Jacob will speak to later, you will realize that, uh, you know, internet is still a very expensive commodity in this part of the world. And we're providing them with soft skills through business training. When they have this capacity, we then convene the ecosystem and the market, you know, through summits, uh, conferences, uh, fireside charts, hackathons. We're now just building a digital marketplace as well, where they can be able to present um, their solutions. And finally, we link them to promoters. So people who are putting in uh, capital and equity into these businesses so that they can be able to scale. We are running a catalytic fund uh, financed by the U, uh, DFID. Um, we are partnering with impact funds and we're partnering with other donors. So our role essentially is to look at this entire ecosystem of innovation and to make the cogs move together so that we can collaborate in addressing this um, 
um, public social issues. And now I would like us to just get into the flesh of the conversation by inviting Jacob. Like I said, Jacob was a fellow, um, is a fellow uh, of E4C and was part of the team that conducted this research. And he'll just take us through uh, the findings of the research. Welcome, Jacob. Thank you, Ronald. Uh, I'll go through the uh, overview of the research and what we were doing in Northern Kenya. And uh, the research focused on Northern Kenya, which is majorly the arid part of Kenya and consists quite a huge area, which is 70% of all the land mass in Kenya and houses 30% of the population. And we focus on four key areas, which is in agriculture, in health, jobs, and education. Some of the distinct characteristics in this place that may be different from the rest of Kenya include the nomadic lifestyle and uh, the area also has a low population, population density, a uh, shortage of key infrastructure that makes it hard to provide services and to for, makes it hard for innovators to penetrate this area. We also have low rainfall which affects agricultural activities and limited job opportunities, which is a common problem all over Kenya. In terms of communication, uh, information and communication technologies, there's uh, limited connectivity and uh, there are several unique challenges in uh, Northern Kenya. However, uh, it's not all doom in, uh, in Northern Kenya. There are also positive stories of solutions that are at work as, I, as they are highlighted in this report. And as a, a, maybe Abdino will present uh, uh, next after me. Uh, Next slide. Uh, I want to mention something about challenges implementing the solutions. Uh, and one of the things that we, challenges that we found for innovators is the, uh, the supporting infrastructure is lacking or limited. And most areas have an, uh, the areas that are covered with network have a 2G connection. And uh, there's also shortage of electricity and the last mile access is a challenge even in urban areas where just getting good reliable internet is a problem. We also have a challenge in education and digital skills in terms of uh, basic literacy is low, although it's improving, but uh, digital literacy is a problem. So when one is having a solution, you want to target people in this area, you have to be considerate of the fact that there is low literacy levels. In terms of, uh, infrastructure that could enable all that, it's also a challenge. And one more thing is about exposure, where people use feature phones with limited services such as voice and SMS. And if one is to focus on the people in this region, you are probably thinking of uh, technologies that can, rely, can work on feature phones, uh, utilizing the voice and SMS service, or find ways of going around that. We, also see that most people are not familiar with uh, various uh, benefits of internet and may not find it uh, relevant as one person says that they don't see the need to keep that, uh, their mobile data on because they are not online, they don't find anything of value and they are not exposed to the internet. We have a challenge with culture where the region is linguistically diverse. So someone going into Northern Kenya, you are meeting many different languages which you need to find your way through them. But then there is also the nomadic lifestyle, which means people who are moving from place to place and where you found them this season may not be the place where they will be next season. Uh, then we have uh, gender roles and such, which can affect uh, how people interact with tech technologies, like who handles the money, who is doing uh, di uh, different kind of roles. And also it affects education, where we find that there could be a uh, difference in education levels between men and women in those societies. Uh, next slide. Now, in terms of opportunities and consideration, there's 
an enabling environment that has been occasioned by the uh, one of the things is devolution, where we have uh, regional governments that have been in place for eight years as of now. And these are able to promote equitable distribution of resources and help solve the problem of exclusion in those places. We also have uh, the county government implementing their own growth strategies, including supporting innovation in their areas. So for anyone seeking to venture into this area, the devolution is helping uh, to make things easier. Uh, we have also various government policies as highlighted in the report, like the digital economy blueprint, the Jira digital program. We also have vision 2030 development strategy for Northern Kenya and other arid lands. The universal service fund, which is also helping fund access to uh, telecommunication services for people in Northern Kenya. In terms of collaboration, there, is, there are also stakeholders, drive, there are various stakeholders driving innovations in those places. And we have the national government, I also talked of local governments, uh, various agencies, private sector, civil, civil society, and hubs. There are some hubs which have made some inroads there, although they are few. Uh, so uh, an innovator may need to collaborate with one of those stakeholders to make it easy to access. Some of the consideration for the innovators is to come up with technologies that do not demand a lot of resources, to partner with others, uh, partners who are already on the ground so that they can lower the cost of entry into those areas, coming up with simple to use technologies like the ones that depend on SMS that can work offline and that can be used by people with low literacy levels. So in an, that's an overview of the re, uh, report. I know it has been shared in the chat. Thanks a lot, Jacob. Really appreciate um, you know, that very high level uh, view of what is captured in the report. And we will get into, the, into, into a bit more detail when we come round to uh, having a discussion. So I'd just like to introduce Abdin Noor, who's a practitioner um, in Northern Kenya, uh, born and raised there. And he will speak to us a little bit about his solution, M. Luga. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, basically, M. Luga is, uh, is uh, offline. As the Jacob said, one of the, one of the considerations you need to consider when venturing into this region is you have to consider offline applications due to, uh, due to connectivity. So basically MLUGA is uh, offline interactive mother tongue based learning, uh, lang language learning uh, app that translates the syllabus, Kenyan syllabus into indigenous language. As you can see from the picture here, uh, those are uh, uh, exclusively Somali kids and they only speak Somali language. Imagine when they walk to a classroom for the first time, but the language of instruction is either English or Swahili or even French. And the only language they understand is their mother tongue. So MBLUGA basically helps them learn using their own mother tongue. And basically language barrier is not a Kenyan problem, it's an African problem. Every African child is struggling with a language that is not his first language. So basically MBLUGA now helps this kind of, uh, these children at least acquire basic literacy and numeracy using the language that they understand and they are proud of. Next slide, please. So um, in Northern Kenya, we have a um, very serious uh, what do you call, uh, educational crisis. And when I'm saying Northern Kenya, we're talking about 70%, as Jacob said, 70% of the landmass. And before even COVID disruption, most schools were closed. Why? Due to insecurity. Most of the non-local teachers who were teaching the area were targeted by, 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 by Al-Shabaab and the other security threats. So hence, there was mass exodus of teachers from the region. N not only the security, but also the nomadic lifestyle. We move from one place to another, hence we move away from, from, from schools that leaving a high number of dropouts. We have mass exam failure because of limited resources we have there, limited the teachers, limited access to, uh, to, to learning content. So basically the, the academic challenge that exists there is just beyond explanation. We also have, uh, uh, they say, like I said, the dropout is, is so high because of the nomadic lifestyle. So now, how is this M Luga offline helping them? Imagine uh, you wake up one morning, but you are told we are moving. But if you have your M Luga tablet, which is solar powered, and the apps, which means you can move, you can learn on the go. 
you can learn without the teacher. Once you, maybe when you come back to, 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 the, to the area, maybe you can cope up with the syllabus because you have the, syllab the content, basically the digital content in your own mother tongue. Next, please. Next slide. So um, the last one month I was in Wajia and actually I'm going back this weekend, uh, hopefully. Uh, on the first pictures, this is a new school in Wajia South. It has 80 students and it's still enrolling. Unfortunately, they only have two teachers. So you can check their teacher uh, student ratio It's so high. So I'm actually uh, taking 25 tablets next this weekend with MLUGA tab, uh, apps, offline apps, so they can learn with limited uh, resources. And below here, the pictures with, uh, with, uh, with a project and a screen, those are secondary schools also in Wajia Sound with my new, also another initiative called Elim Machinani. And you might find a whole teacher, a whole school with only one teacher or two teachers. And there's some subjects are not even taught because they don't have teachers. But because of Elim Machinani, now they can access digital content from one to form four in a, in a, in a what do you call a remote content access point. It doesn't require internet, it doesn't require connectivity, it doesn't require anything, but you need to power it. So with that, pro the whole lesson is projected, like physics, chemistry, biology, without even a teacher. So basically now we have bridged the teacher shortage gap. And these are two of the solutions are currently being used in the northern part of Kenya. One is MLUGA for early years of education, where learners are accessing uh, uh, digital content using their own mother tongue, and also for secondary schools, they're accessing form to form for digital content using a content access point. And uh, the lesson are being projected in the classroom. We also put their Khan Academy offline, which is offline basically, uh, Wikipedia that's offline, and also other open educational source. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so imagine being the, uh, the first innovator from the region with no hub, with no tech mentorship, with no accelerator program, nothing. How did MLUGA became uh, like made to this, this far? Uh, this Africa Union Innovation, this is the 10 outstanding Africa innovation, innovators pitch. This was just for one month ago. MLUGA was awarded 10 best startups by Africa Union. On the right, we have uh, Africa Telecommunication Union, first runner up. Egypt was number one and, and MLUGA was number two basically providing solution for COVID-19 and also an um, education inequality in Africa. If you, come, if you come below there, sorry, you will find MLUGA as the uh, best 100 startups in Istanbul out of 160,000 applications. On your right, you also have uh, Africa Tech Summit, uh, Kigali uh, last year on January, where 11, only 11 startups were selected to pitch at Africa Tech Summit. So basically without a hub, Without the tech mentorship, without a Twitter program, we managed to at least uh, through you know uh, you know thick and thin to find this kind of award. And I will show you what could have been done right for us to to at least excel even do better. Thanks. Uh, next, please. So, and this is my wish: if I am Luga had the following and uh, support or from, uh, from uh, let's say from stakeholders, from education, what do you call from education stakeholders, from the government, from everyone, it could have been, it could have done better. So what support does the innovators need in Northern Kenya, like me? So first of all, we need an incubation hub so that anyone with a crazy idea can just walk in, uh, get, you know, support, uh, startup support from that incubator programs, also innovation hubs. So. We also have, uh, we, we need also need the innovation mentors who can walk you through the innovation journey, tell you about the, uh, you know, pitching uh, skills, tell you about what's happening uh, in the tech world and also help you, you know, in, into connection to the market. So we also need uh, early ICT training adoption in primary and secondary schools. In the Northern Kenya, we have clubs in schools, maybe agricultural club, we have uh, uh, what do you call debate club, but we don't have ICT clubs. So I think we need to have ICT clubs at early years, you know, of, of education to the high, to the secondary school. That's where we we are set, we need to set up ICT um, uh, clubs. We also need free ICT training skills after form four. Imagine when students work from form four, they don't know uh, any digital skills. They don't even Microsoft Word even is a problem. So we need to give them free uh, ICT skills. We also need the fully uh, equipped labs in schools. 
every school. Currently, there are none. We have we need innovation competitions. Uh, we need ICT innovation hackathons and boot camps, holiday coding classes, government policy institutions. As I'm speak right now, I have a very big challenge with the with the government because they don't they can't approve the content I I have I've developed because of the bureaucratic na bureaucratic nature. You have to pay two, uh, twenty thousand dollars. You have to go through a rigorous process for you to get approved. We also actually let me surprise you. There are no ICT colleges. In, in, in the Northern Kenya, the whole of Northern Kenya. We only have one university which was under attack and are currently it's just struggling. And that university doesn't even offer ICT courses. Next, please. So what are the unique opportunities uh, that's available now, right now? So I can say Northern Kenya is a gold mine for new innovators because, because of the uh, rural urban migration due to the harsh uh, climatic weather, and now people are becoming moving more to urban. So what I'm saying is, we have, this is a blank check for innovators. So especially the social innovators. So you can set up ICT colleges, innovation hubs, e-commerce platforms. Uh, we have been, we, you can have innovation on value addition on animal product. As we can say, 90% of the camel, uh, camels in Kenya come from the Northern part of Kenya. Almost fifth, half, what do you call 56% or 59% of cattle come from Northern Kenya. Almost 70% of goods come from Northern Kenya. So we can do a lot of things with, 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 the, with the products. So we also have agri-tech uh, innovations. We have climatic uh, innovations, peace and COVID resolution. Actually, the list is endless. There's a huge potential in this region, which is yet to be, to be, uh, to be implemented. Next, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abdi Noor, um, you know, for sharing your experiences and these are real life experiences and challenges that you face on the ground every day. But it's also encouraging to see that uh, innovators like yourself are not being held back by these challenges, but you're still, you know, going out and facing those challenges head on to provide solutions. We will be coming back to talk a little bit more about that. Let me now bring in Caroline, um, who's a development expert. Thank you, Ronald. Um, so my presentation will look at the drivers, the challenges and the needs to accelerate digital development in Kenya. And I'll also give you a brief introduction about the UNDP and the UNDP Accelerator Lab. Next slide. So the UNDP is UN Global, Network, Global Development Network, and we advocate for change and connect countries to knowledge, experience, and resources to help build a better life. We look at challenges such as inequality, uh, climate change, election and development, and we design our programs to link, to look at the nuanced uh, effects of inequality and exclusion towards achieving sustainable and inclusive economic growth. We do have a new digital strategy, which is aimed at better harnessing technology and innovation to deliver better and more results in the countries and communities we work in. The UNDP Accelerator Lab is a new service offering within the UNDP. We work with people, governments, and the private sector to reimagine development. And our task is to look at new data, new partnership, to look at new trends within the country and beyond, to map solutions, particularly local and grassroots solutions, and to test these different solutions and prototypes with the objective of using this experiential way of learning to scale and grow local solutions. So we have four different offerings within the, within the Accelerator Lab, which summarized is around data collection, knowledge creation and harnessing, solution mapping, experimentation and community outreach. Next. So for the UNDP Accelerator Lab in Kenya, we are looking at youth unemployment. And we're looking at four approaches to youth unemployment. The first is young people's access to information, where we believe when young people have more access to information around what opportunities are out there, they'll be able to use and translate this information into businesses and jobs for themselves. We're also looking at employability mismatch, skills mismatch. We know that some of the institutions of learning in our country do not address the market needs and the industry needs, and we want to bridge that gap. The third approach is looking at expanding opportunities in untapped sectors, such as the creative, the circular and digital economies, which are some of the emerging economies, which have great potential for jobs and businesses for young people in the country. 
And the fourth is supporting nascent micro and small businesses and solutions. We believe if these small startups are, or nascent organizations and businesses, if they're supported to grow, they'll become huge employers of the young people. So we've been doing a number of things. Um, when it comes to technological, we've been supporting local innovators through innovation challenges and acceleration initiatives. We recently collaborated with Tech Konza Technopolis to host the Great COVID-19 Innovation Challenge. Um, we took through 15 of these innovators from across the country through an acceleration program and their solutions were looking at decent work, um, food systems and health systems. But in addition to that, we're also working with government through the SDG Accelerator Lab to look at issues such as intellectual property frameworks and funds. We also been working on access to information by bridging the digital divide through different webinars, new, different knowledge products. And in addition, we've been collecting data to support meaningful engagement with young people on governance and COVID-19, as well as collecting data on the digital preparedness of MSMEs. That's a snapshot. So what's the relevance of the digital economy for young people? The digital economy is propelling Kenya's economic growth. And this is driven by increased mobile telephony. Uh, Jacob has mentioned, you know, the high mobile penetration in Kenya, which is around 90% internet usage. So 46% of our population has access to broadband. Of course, this is not equal. So there are some areas, there are some people who have more access than others, but generally one in four Kenyans do have access to internet. There's an uptake of e-commerce and this has increased, especially with COVID-19. But as of 2017, Kenya had between 2.6 million to 3.3 million online shoppers. This has really wildly increased with, uh, with, with COVID-19 and the dependence that we now have of, on, on online spaces. There's also the expansion of digital services. So there are financial services which are on mobile, such as you know, M banking, digital credit, M shuari, and also government services. So there's a lot of movement towards the digital space, particularly in Kenya. And this has been enabled by the infrastructure that Jacob talked about and the, and the different investments that the, the, the government has made. And the gig economy, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of interest in the gig economy, which is facilitating more than 600,000 online jobs. Next. So the future is digital. And, and this picture just reminds me of the, the cartoon that Jetsons and, and how far ahead they were in their time. But right now this is becoming more and more of a reality for our generation. So next. What do we expect uh, in our country? So we've seen a fast growing digital startup scene in Kenya, over 38 startup incubators and accelerators are currently in operation. Once again, this is not equal. So a lot of them are clustered around Nairobi and several secondary cities. There's a lot of interest and engagement in robotics and robotic technology, which is will play a big role in customer engagement and automation of business processes. We expect artificial intelligence to be more relevant and utilized in Kenya. We've seen more digitally enabled services and I've mentioned such as the financial services, but we see this growing with e-entertainment, with e-lifestyle, e-hospitality, e-healthcare and education. So more services are getting online. We see Kenya to be a knowledge hub. So we've known Kenya to be a business and tech hub, but we're seeing interest um, in the intellectual products and services available in Kenya. We've seen Stanford setting up shop here. We've seen Harvard also setting up shop here. So there's a lot of interest in our intellectual resource. We've seen blockchain technology becoming more used and engaged in the, and giving us the potential to provide even more access to essential services for people in the remote areas. So we've seen Bangla Pesa um, by Grassroot Economics. Next. So this first picture is a, um, a group of young people who have devised um, a robotics to facilitate persons with disability to access and use um, of robotic arms. And these three robots um, were facilitated by UNDP to the government of Kenya to enable in um, COVID-19 response, especially in hotspot areas such as airports and hospitals. Next. There are gaps and barriers to digital transformation. And we know that, you know, when 
we cannot afford to leave anyone behind in the journey towards digital transformation. And some of the gaps, you know, Jacob and Ahmed have talked about them, such as limited access to relevant digital skills. Majority of the secondary schools do not offer computer studies as a standalone compulsory course. And even though there are initiatives such as the digital literacy plan, um, a lot of schools do not have access to the technology, whether it is tablets, whether it is internet access, whether it is electricity. There's weak quality and relevance of training at tertiary institutes. So I met um, some of the doctors, you know, working, you know, right now, and they talked about the absence of computer training or computer education in, within the medical um, sector. So when you don't have access to computer training, and then the country is evolving, the global, you know, development when it comes to healthcare is is very tech. Uh, dependent and that's not a skill that you're familiarized with in your in your course then that becomes a huge challenge there's a lot of digital exclusion in the rural areas we've talked about that but also when we look at persons with disability how many innovations are related to addressing uh, the challenges a persons with disability face how many of these startups how many of uh, these innovations address gender issues or how many startups are even led by um, led by women so that's there's a huge divide when it comes to access and inclusive innovation there's poor engagement of digital technology within the informal economy, which is the highest employers of young people. We talked about high cost of internet and electricity. And then there's need for more academic rigor. Uh, the rate at which we are um, evolving when it comes to access to digital technology, there's need for more research, more analysis, more data to provide predictive information for policymakers to be to make the necessary decisions to protect local industry. So we've seen how Amazon, um, how different global um, conglomerates are coming into the space and into the Kenyan space. And it's, it's, it's opening up uh, the country to more markets, to more services, to more products, but at the same time, it's really limiting the access of, of local industry. So we need to understand and make predictive information that is guided by data. At the same time, we need to push towards um, an African digital market where we can be able to support our local industry to be able to trade um, and, and access each other's products and services from an African perspective. Next slide. So the UNDP conducted um, a survey of um, the digital preparedness of MSMEs, especially in light of COVID-19. And we saw that 62% um, of the MSMEs in the country are in the nascent level. That means they, do, they have very little maturity when it comes to digital technology. And this, is a, this is a challenge because a lot um, a lot of the businesses, a lot of the enterprises that were able to be resilient uh, during COVID-19 were because of their, their access to and their engagement with digital technology. And so we queried them on what, what do they need to adopt digital technology? And we saw um, opportunities such as skills development, and we've talked about this by the previous panelists, internet access, um, knowledge of and, and, and use better use of social media platforms, so one of the um, highlights from that survey was that only 15% of MSMEs own or have websites. So there's need to build their capacities and, and just support them to be able to use uh, digital platforms. There's need for continuous learning and mentorship. Um, there's need for computer hardware, need for computer software, and also um, platforms uh, for them to access a wider market, uh, whether nationally or globally. And then there's need for technical support, um, for example, software. Um, so the UNDP has, has been able to collect this data and look at how to transform their existing strands of work. So we are supporting, for example, the, um, the setting up of of innovation hubs in Marsabit and Tana River. We are supporting the revival and expansion of BHR centers. We are, ex we are supporting the acceleration of um, 
of youth innovators across the country. And there's more that can be done by the development sector and engaging with this information and, and pulling different um, insights from the local and the, and the global scene helps us to do this better. We do recognize that inclusion is really an important aspect when it comes to digital transformation. And that's why we've invested specifically uh, in, in, in supporting PWG centric innovations through our, our latest digital, um, disability inclusive innovation challenge. But, and we, we hope to continue to partner with different stakeholders and different partners to be able to drive this agenda. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carol, for sharing, um, you know, this critical work that uh, UNDP and, and development partners like yourselves are, are doing on the ground. I would just like to, and, and keep the questions coming. Um, we have a few, I think, maybe not, <laughs> but keep the questions coming. I will have um, an opportunity to ask the panelists to respond to your questions. I, I, I would just like to bring back Jacob because Jacob, you were on the ground doing these things and we have consistently had you know the, the 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 key barriers to entry and i saw Winnie okelo uh, make a comment that we need to remove this this barriers so you know whether you're talking about the cost of internet or devices um a lack of hubs which i think again all the speakers have spoken about lack of infrastructure skills skills development what did you find on the ground what's happening what are the interventions that are there and how in your recommendations from the report, do we accelerate this? Uh, thank you, Ronald. Uh, I think, as I mentioned, it's not all doom and gloom in Northern Kenya. There are some things that are taking place and uh, Abinur has taken us through that. And uh, one of the things we, we saw that's happening is the, uh, that's major is partnership between different stakeholders to enable entrepreneurs and innovators to penetrate the market and or the region. And uh, surprisingly, the county governments in Northern Kenya are very welcoming as opposed to other places. They, those who have tried to work with them, some have said they are more receptive to uh, people who are coming with solutions, maybe because there's a bigger need there, but uh, they, are, they, they are open to collaborate with people who have solutions for those places. We, uh, but then we also need to have uh, various uh, policies implemented fully. One of the examples is the, the there's a, a fiber uh, internet connection to almost all county, to all county headquarters in Kenya. But they are not being used optimally. There are various uses that uh, people on the ground can make use of them. But it has not been fully implemented. If we see what the uh, Communications Authority is doing with the Universal Service Fund, they are uh, increasing connectivity to the remote parts. And while this takes, uh, uh, if, if this is accelerated, we'll see more people connected. And uh, this will allow more innovators to be able to offer their services in those areas. There, there are various stakeholders who are partner, partnering. There's one example of uh, uh, someone was saying that it was very difficult to start their services in Isiolo, but through partnership, they were able to get uh, people who have been on the ground. They know the area. They can lead them to the farmers. Uh, I mentioned that the area is quite expansive, uh, which means that it's hard for someone to leave Nairobi today and go to uh, Marsabit County. They land in Marsabit town, and then they want to go to a place like uh, Old Road or even Kargi, they, uh, uh, an innovator may not know those places, but working with people on the ground, it's possible to do that. But then also increasing the literacy levels, we need people on the ground to learn various skills like ICT training skills. And sometimes uh, a county government may want to offer those ones because that's in their, within their mandates to train people post college in post high school education on, digital skills, but you find that we don't have reliable power that can be used. Some of the solutions to that is use of solar power and uh, it has its own limit because why, when it comes to ICT, it's easy. We have computers and such, which are easy to handle with solar power. But if you are doing courses like welding, where 
you are helping people to be skilled so that you can work as well that it may not be possible unless there is means power connected so at the end we need all stakeholders to collaborate to make uh, those work and also there is we encourage uh, there is there is there are social enterprises that are targeting those places i think this need to encourage more and more because the problems that are there it means there are opportunities for innovators thanks a lot for that uh, uh, jacob and 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 you know i and i i had wanted to go to abdinur but let me just jump to carol because you bring in a critical component uh, around how do we partner how so carol we have built this knowledge around you know uh, um, the opportunities the situation that is on the ground how do we convert this into real opportunities with money in the pocket for people of northern kenya converting these opportunities into economic activities i mean you've spoken about 62 percent of smes uh, you know being nascent in the digital economy space i don't know what that rep representative figure would be in northern kenya probably higher how do partnerships work so you doing what you're doing private sector academia and communities and government um please share you know just your thoughts as we ask for other questions to be sent in all right thank you ronald so one of the things that that we see as a gap and as an opportunity as well is a recognition that knowledge is currency. There's so much that is happening in Northern Kenya that is not, that doesn't have um, an audience, that doesn't have a market um, in, the, in the national and the global space. So how do we link, how do we pro provide a pipeline of, 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 of information flow that can, can translate into a market, can translate into, um, in, in, into financial resources or, 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 or benefits for the people of Northern Kenya. So providing this platform is very, this, this platform is very, very crucial. And that can be, can be done through government spaces, um, government enabled spaces like Biashara centers or innovation hubs, but that can also be a private sector making deliberate investments in the region um, to just provide that pipeline of, of information. Thanks a lot. Yeah, and and I think this is this is a critical component in terms of how do we build pipeline, how do we ensure that you, even when investors come into the ground, there are ready innovations that can be scalable and that mm -hmm. can have a payback. And I can see uh, Bryce Newman is asking, you know, has there been an observation around any innovations that are uniquely originally Kenyan? Uh, and I'd just like to tell Bryce, Abdinur spoke about one that is an ed tech focused one and that is very local. And I can pivot this question into what I wanted to ask you, Abdinur. The, the, obviously, with all these challenges, the cost of ownership of any such digital technologies, of course, goes up. Um, so what has been your experience in terms of partners who are willing to come in to the risk? you know, your, your, your solution and how then do we reduce the total, the, the cost of total ownership? Uh, thank you so much, Ronald. I think uh, there's one aspect that uh, we, we focus so much on, uh, on the problems, but there's so much solution. Uh, as Jacob said, there's so much solution. Actually in Wajia, Garissa, Mandera, the solar, you can cook an egg even with the outside solar. That's how hot it is because sometimes it goes up to up to 39 40 degrees so we can tap to that so uh, into that uh, uh, solar energy at least to provide uh, solar to our our tablets to our computer labs and everything but unfortunately we don't see many investors tapping into that uh, in that field so i think uh, it's not about we are not uh, short of uh, innovation we are not short of uh, solutions but we are short of uh, infrastructure and devices one for, for for example for mluga app right now the app is ready it's offline what we need is just seven inch tablet which can be solar powered and a seven inch tablet can cost less than fifty dollars so we just need a, a powering system uh, using solar and the tablet and uh, currently i'm glad we are through africa telecommunication union we are we are talking with the, some some of the our partners like gsma and huawei 
I have uh, approached them with a, with a suggestion, that, suggestion that they provide with us uh, with tablets that are solar powered. So basically what we need right now is just tablets and, uh, and computers, but solutions are really there. So we are not short of solutions. Thanks a lot, Abdenur. Unfortunately, unfortunately, as just the conversation is beginning to get uh, exciting, we, we, we unfortunately have to bring this to a close. Um, I can see Danielle uh, Bricker is saying, Ray and COSA program actually should focus on powering up schools and hospitals. How are these things developing with these programs? So I would just like us to bring this to a wrap. Just your final thoughts in less than a minute. Um, um, Jacob, how, how, what, what, are you, what is your view from the conversation that we've had here today? And how do we leverage pro government programs like AJIRA uh, to be able to coordinate all the efforts from stakeholders in these regions? Thank you, Ronald. I think one uh, key area is uh, developing skills. And we have people. Uh, we have people who are very capable in northern Kenya, and we have various channels that are available that may not be working optimally. And one of the best things that needs to happen is to see that the education systems are working as they should be, as, uh, and that's similar to what Abdenur is doing. And once we equip people to be literate, we can move to the next step of instilling digital literacy skills. But in overall, I think the opportunities can be done if there is more coordination and if everyone is playing their part, like the county governments are working with the innovators, the hubs are there, the, there is support for uh, entrepreneurs who want to venture into those places and there is the right in, relevant infrastructure in place in those areas. Thanks a lot, Jacob. You know, you, you, you have given us a good context because, you, you know, you understand that territory from experience. And one of the things you raised was the issue of language as a barrier. Um, now, from all the things that you have pointed out as a barrier, I think external parties can come and help solve those, you know, through partnerships, through investments and such like. But there are other cultural contexts. Um, that are actually captured also in the report, you know, whether that is the nomadic lifestyle, uh, the issue of gender and, and the role of gender in creating this digital gap, religion. What's your view on, as you wrap it up, what's your view on how then these soft issues are, uh, are built into the solutions that we're looking for? <clears throat> Thank you so much. And, but for, 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 for the audience, let me tell you, my grandmother in Wajia South now is sending me a WhatsApp a voice call. That's you know, how, how things are changing nowadays in terms of culture, in terms of integration. So what I can say is uh, there are challenges there, but we are, we are slowly overcoming it. And uh, in terms of uh, uh, the, 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 the population, actually the last, two, last month we traveled 1,700 kilometers with our senator. But unfortunately, you travel 100 kilometers, you find a very small settlement. You move to another 100 kilometers, you find another small settlement. So I wish, there's a, I wish there was a way they could just come together into, into one place so that at least we can share resources because uh, they are so desperate, desperate what you call, uh, located. But uh, all in all, all I can say is uh, if we have a hub that you know, addresses all this, the, the challenges that we're talking about, and uh, with true partnership. I think we met also Carol in one of my making noise around through at Kenya School of Government. And uh, I'm still extending a partnership with UNDP and, uh, and also Engineering for Change. At least uh, let's support the Nomadic Hub because with the hub fully equipped, I think most of these uh, challenges will, will overcome. But for cultural, I think there's nothing we can do about it. But uh, let me tell you something. We are some a little bit you know, coming into out of the closet as we speak because of the, the social media and the and diversity we are experiencing. Thank you for that insight. Thank you so much, Abdinur. Carol, take us home. In, in what, where is your headspace as a development partner? I mean, we know sometimes we put too much uh, baggage on the likes of the UN and the World Bank, and we expect you guys to pull off magic. Where's your headspace in terms of 
what are the little gains we can get quickly so that the, the ball starts moving. Right. So I think one of the things, and Abdinur has talked about it, um, is supporting this community-centric innovations because what we, we have no um, lack when it comes to ingenuity, creativity as a, as, a, as a country. And some of these solutions are quite relevant, like, you know, some, like what Abdinur is working on is quite relevant, is quite, quite user-centric, and these solutions need support. So what we need to do as an international uh, development development partner and even the government and other stakeholders is support these innovations because and support them to scale support them to be um to 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 be able to be produced in mass and to be able to achieve a wider market because these solutions are what the community needs and are what um, is meeting the relevant need at that time so that's that's what i think is needed Thank you so much, Carol. Thank you, our, our panelists, Jacob, uh, for all the good work that you did uh, on the ground in terms of putting this research together. Abdinur for the fantastic work you're doing, and Carol for just uh, 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 providing that uh, thought leadership. Uh, Mariela, I think this is the point I hand back over to you so that you can bring this to a close. Thank you so much, uh, Ron. It was a, a true pleasure to hear um, you speak, you all speak, and I. Uh, we were also discussing briefly that it's a, um, it's really our mission at Engineering for Change to have a panel full of Kenyans discussing the, the ICTs in Kenya. So we were thrilled to see you all, you know, discussing uh, the issues, challenges, and opportunities, and, and we hope that we can keep building the future together, um, not only of Kenya, but of ICTs in the world. Thank you so much, Ron, for this incredible partnership, um, for the research collaboration. Thanks uh, to our speakers as well, to our fellow for presenting the work. Um, we're very proud of, of, of the report and we invite you to read it. Before we move on, um, I just wanted to remind everyone that on March 4th, we have our next webinar, Advancing Sustainable Engineering, Building the Future Workforce. And that's aligned to the World Engineering Day for Sustainable Development. So we really uh, invite you also to continue the conversations around the research collaborations that our fellows did. But more than that, it's you know some insights around different SDGs and what we're finding as an overall trend in some of these uh, worldwide issues. So we invite you to broaden what you just heard here um, for our next webinar. Uh, we really want to thank you all again for attending. Thanks, Ron. Thanks, Caroline, Abdinur, Jacob. This was incredible. This is my perfect start of, of a Wednesday for, for us here at E4C. And we'll see you soon. Be sure to sign up as E4C member. And if you have any questions, reach out to us. Thank you.